Bye. Okay. Um, so just let me back. And now I have also the registration con recording controls. Um, just let me. I mean, okay, I will need the whole screen. Okay, so um, everyone can see my slides. Yes. Yeah. Very beautifully crafted mm -hmm. slides. Um, basically, um, my lesson will be a little of a mix of that and that and that, but the point is that everything will be around data gathering. Um, I guess it would, it would be a, let's say, a very interactive lesson because I'm going to show you something and maybe you want to follow. Uh, at some point, I'll just give you files if you can follow and use those files to do stuff. That's super good. If you can't, uh, I mean, everything is recorded and the files will be available for you to do whatever you want with that. Um, okay, so first thing first, um, a little bit of presentation, sorry. Um, no, I wasn't there yesterday because uh, unless you are in the in the Alexa group, um, so you didn't get to know me um, because I basically I have a four months old kid to take care of and my life is t completely crazy. Um, okay, so the thing is that um, I guess I'm the quantitative methodologist in this which sounds kind of weird, uh, but the point is that I'm the technical guy for everything you would need, and my role in the summer school would be to actually make this lesson and also act as a support, which is something that I already did with a part of you. Um, not just to troubleshoot stuff, but uh, actually to let you, to introduce you into the more, let's say, technical aspects of data gathering and data processing. Oh, and by the way, the lesson is called data gathering, but uh, will feature also a part of data, data cleanup and processing because all those are things that that actually make a, a good deal of your job. So as I was saying to the group yesterday, uh, so to, the, to the Alexa group yesterday, one of the points when you work with social media data, one of the most, um, one of the things that people tend to ignore is that you need to have dedicate a lot of time to the cleanup of data so basically when you got data out of something even if it's like a very dedicated i mean tool uh we'll see crowd tangle for example where we'll see um i mean twitter api even if you have those kind of tools at some point they will be quite quite um quite dirty and it will need to to clean a little bit of it and to make preliminary analysis, okay, in order to know what is going on. And the other thing that, I mean, bears remembering is that when you work with, uh, let's say quantitative data, uh, but I want you to let you know, I want, want you to know that I'm a super pro mixed method guy, meaning that um, while my main beef is to do, uh, I mean, computational stuff. Um, I was originally trained as a qualitative analyst, meaning that I'm fully a cognizant of the fact or the fact that you would need to have. Um, I mean, a qualitative mindset is a good thing to have when dealing with social network data. Okay, maybe you would need something else. Maybe you won't. Uh, but the point is that you would most definitely something that is required in order to understand nuances and context which is by the way something that that uh, machines can do so um which probably have seen this from ali uh, but it bears remembering on my side that even if you see i mean tons of paper that well i have used support vector machine to label those kind of data and those kind of data the point is that if you have the chance um, I mean, manual tagging is still a great option, especially if you have a very, obviously it depends on the nature and the phenomenon that you are going to explore. Um, but at the same time, it depends on the amount of data that you have. So basically you have these two things that you need to balance. And speaking of that, um, so as a social scientist, you're probably quite familiar with 
quantitative analysis, let's say, and usually you rank the cases or, or, or maybe you've done some some network analysis at some point, uh, and you rank the cases in, 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 in thousands, sorry, hundreds and thousands. But the point is that when you start working with this kind of data, um, you work with millions of data. Why is that so? Because, I mean, that's pretty stimulating, uh, let's say epistemological conversation. That means mm, turns around um, one simple thing that uh, social science, it's, it's, it's um, being conceived as something that relies on sampling. Well, the point is that we do have, and, and that is totally critical for this, this class, uh, that we do have the capacity right now, um, and I'm not using that hypothetically, to gather the whole universe of observation. So say that at some point you want to uh, understand what people have been saying about Me Too as a digital social movement uh, and then probably the approach of this um, to, 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 to make it function this kind of observation uh, up to like three five years ago would be well I gather something and then uh, then I sample and then I analyze activity peaks and those kind of things but as soon as I mean technology progresses and our capacity to analyze that technology progresses with technology, uh, we're able to actually use data sets that are the full gamut of opinion. So basically you would have a, a something that we're doing in another project. So we're gathering all of the uh, Me Too posts in, in a given time span. Um, and those rank in millions. So um, again, which takes us to a third thing um, when you're doing this kind of intensive study, which you may want to do, you may not want to do, but I'm, ju I'm just relying in the worst case scenario, scenario. Uh, at some point, the kind of computer you use, it's, 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 it's a factor. So you basically train it to uh, know that every laptop will run SPSS, every laptop will run Stata, unless you are very, very, very old laptops. In this case, try to have a network analysis with several millions of data points. And that means that you would need, um, I mean, you would need a proficient machine to do that. And also will take some time. So data gathering is not instantaneous because um, requests to, to, to Twitter, to Facebook have a delivery time, so we'll see better with Twitter, but the point it will take time. Uh, also data processing at a large scale, so computational sociology takes some time to, to deliver results. So uh, if you are interested in this kind of field, so please take in mind that the kind of computer you use, the kind of time that computer will take to process data will be a factor. Okay, so uh, having said that, um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, again, a lot of the lesson will be on how to get data. Um, then we have time, um, and we will cover what is scraping, what is API access, so what are different tools that you can use, hodgepodge tools that you can use to uh, actually gather data out of, out of, um, out of social networks um, without any idea that this will give you a complete scenario because uh, basically, for example, like think about TikTok, um, no one knew that it existed like one year ago and now we have API uh, classes for Python in order to harvest content out of TikTok and now we're having papers. So it's a field that is a full blown expansion. So I don't have, uh, I mean, the pretense to cover it, everything, I'll just show you a very, basic stuff uh, but i guess th these are the big hitters these are the players that you need to consider when you do data gathering so again um different sources of data api access which means official access to data so it's the kind of like adore the twitter twitter for example opens it for you for gather data um as opposed to scraping, which means, and I'll we'll see in a minute, that you gather everything that has been visualized on your on your 
uh, I mean, on your screen, uh, which is actually the vector to obtaining data in the case of some services that are not allowing you to go that um, gather that data. Uh, so then we, we move to Twitter API version two, which is the the current version of Twitter API, which is still in its infancy. Uh, and then we will cover briefly legacy, so version one, which is the API that everyone is using right now. Uh, then other tools, which is hodgepodge of rather different things that you can use to gather data. And then we have still time. I want to show you a couple of, a couple of ways to uh, manually organize and clean your data, which will be more or less an exercise, which I will be doing with you. Okay, so now I promise you that I'm talking about API versus scraping. Um, so I kind of, oh, uh, by the way, if you don't understand something, especially if you don't understand any uh, technical jargon, please stop me and raise your hands and make, it, make yourself known uh, because I know that at some point you may have quite um, I have questions on that. Okay, so basically when you, when we talk about data gathering, we have these two wide families of, of methods um, that on, rely on different, different ways of accessing data. On, on the left, we have API, uh, which is, um, I mean, the authorized way to get data, um, meaning that some platform, uh, YouTube or, or, or um, I don't know, uh, Amazon, for example, uh, makes it available, a bit of data, okay? Or the full complexity of the data they have, as in the case of Twitter or Facebook, if you have crowd tangle access, uh, at least if you're talking about, um, I mean, public data, um, which is basically super easy to do. Uh, usually, it, how you consume API, uh, either you use a tool that leverages pre-existing API. Um, add, for example, CrowdTangle is a good example of that. Um, or you write your own tool. So um, basically it's, it, it's, it's, it's like calling a web page. So, as, but, but it, it returns um, like a JSON structure, which is, um, let's say, a way of formatting data that it's particularly easy for both machines and human beings to process. Okay, so that's that's basically what an API is. Uh, but the point is that in some cases, so in the vast majority of cases, this is limited by design, um, meaning that the companies um, maybe don't want you to look at something and they may have pretty good reasons to do that. Um, especially if privacy is involved. Okay, so take for example, Facebook. So Facebook does not allow you, um, and it does by design, and it's a good idea, to watch uh, content produced by individual beings, so human beings, as opposed to actually gathering data from public, um, public, public entities. Uh, in other cases, and I'm thinking about, um, uh, let's say TripAdvisor, you can get anything out of the platform. And that is just for commercial purposes, which may or may not be, I mean, understandable uh, from a human point of view, uh, but from a research point of view, it's pretty limiting. So say that you are actually doing research, um, something that we did, um, understanding whether or not people have stopped going eating out after the pandemic and you may want to use um, you may want to use uh, TripAdvisor, TripAdvisor data so you don't have any AP not even paying okay uh, well that's this kind of a conundrum if you are a researcher because at some point you have an ethical imperative to preserve stuff uh, but at the same time you have I'm a situation in which you are not allowed to do that um, this is a legal, I mean, issue um, that you could actually scrape the stuff, but uh, usually you would need some, um, it's usually allowed, so people publish paper 
with scraped data, uh, but you may want to check with, especially in Europe, because we have these data protection rules that are quite strict. Uh, this is I mean, legal stuff that is connected to scraping. Um, they're quite strict when it comes to commercial entities. So if you are doing marketing research, if you are doing commercial research, well, that's, you better avoid scraping. But if you're doing scientific research, you may be in the clear, especially if you like for uh, uh, only if you follow the dictates of European privacy law, which means that you are not going, but this also works for API for every other survey for whatever. Uh, meaning that you shouldn't, I mean, publish or make it possible for third parties to identify people out of your research or um or actually especially if if if, if um let's say very delicate personal position like gender identity or political opinions are involved so sorry for the uh i mean the two like legal and and and, and ethical detour but it's something that needs to be done at this point um okay so Getting, getting um, the other thing about API is that they are, they are commercial entities, meaning that at some point, um, I mean, platforms will may decide to terminate those, which is something that happened to me and Ali. Uh, we were actually surveying Instagram, which I think shown some examples of it. Um, and it was 2016, and we were one of the three teams in the world actually gathering those kind of data out of Instagram uh, and ended up again gathering several millions um, I mean, posts and then at some point just uh, Instagram was bought by Facebook and Facebook just decided to terminate the API so meaning that that kind of research was not replicable anymore because I mean at large research didn't have access to API this was kind of a scientific nightmare for us and especially that paper um, took some time to publish for other stuff, but even this, I think it, it helped. Um, so that's, I mean, you have to deal with the commercial entities that at some point unilaterally may decide that now you're not allowed to make your research anymore. So and that is pretty I mean, unethical, if you can, if you care for my opinion. Okay, on the other hand, you have scraping, which means that is a, is a family of techniques that will allow you to um, basically gather data out of everything that you visualize on your on your uh, screen. Uh, won't get into detail with that because it would take like a full course to cover everything. I'll just give you a couple of, of ideas. Uh, and the point is that scraping is super complicated. Uh, not actually super complicated, is far more complicated than API. And it depends on the kind of website that you're scraping. It depends on a couple of things that we'll see later on. Uh, but at the same time, you get everything. So pretty much everything that you visualize on your screen can detail that, that can be have harvested for your purposes. Um, and the point is that um, adding to complexity, um, website you, you, you tend to see um, you see website as monolithic entities maybe uh but it can assure you that even if you see the, the same website is actually pretty identical to, to itself in course of time but under the hood meaning the code that powers the website is subject to frequent change so uh scraping is never done so you write some codes that allows you to get the data and then you need to revise pretty constantly, uh, especially. And this is also true if you, uh, I mean, use, um, let's say, uh, third party tools to scrape, which is, which is a lot of, of things probably on GitHub. So let's make an example um, of, we'll touch Twitter API, which is the most interesting case. Um, you know that Twitter, uh, it's, pretty much the only social network that is almost totally open. Uh, I mean, they're not doing that because they're good. It's actually a commercial model that is good for them because at some point they have been 
um, I mean, they know that the information professional have been relying on Twitter to get the data, and this is something that keeps the attention on Twitter, and so basically they have their own uh, economic turnout in order to do that. But the point is that, um, so Twitter is basically what, where everyone is when it's doing research, which is super stimulating because you can do a lot of stuff with Twitter, but at the same time, oh, yet yeah, that's another Twitter paper. Okay, uh, so while it's super exciting to do stuff with Twitter, I encourage you also to explore other stuff. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, you name it. Um, so in terms of API, which I remember are points of access that you can use to get to the data, um, right now we do have two points of access. So uh, you have what is called V1, which has which is like the main or also legacy, which is the way of the vast majority of people and entities uh, still access Twitter data, um, which is the old stuff. And then you have a lot of, um, oh, by the way, I'm a Python guy. So you will, if you see some code, when, when we'll see some code in this presentation, uh, that is going to be Python code. Uh, but pretty much everything I save with 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 um, Python will be also available for R, okay? Uh, if you are an R person, um, and basically, if you want to gather data out of out of um, out of Twitter API, um, you need to register with them, uh, and then you need to download packages, which is R little bundles of software that uh, do some stuff in Python or in R uh, that let you interface with that thing. Now we do have what we do have, which is super cool, uh, V2, which is has been launched for one less than one year, I think. Um, and it comes in with three tiers, okay? So that is the future of Twitter. That's what they are pushing for people to use. Um, and... The super cool thing about V2 is it gives you a lot of access to everything. And also, uh, you may apply to have academic academic access to that. And we'll get to that in a minute. So you see that we have three tiers, so regular, enterprise, and academic. So regular is basically V1. So um, what you can do with, with Twitter V1, you can uh, gather data for... You can either gather data in streaming, means that if you use a um, research key, uh, meaning that um, search for cats, for example, search for me too, search for whatever, uh, you, will, you will gather the data that have been produced in the, in the same moment as you are doing your research. So uh, up to, you open up your program, and you input your keyword, and then from there on until you shut down your program, you will receive every tweet on that, okay? Uh, unless you are super, unless that object is super massive, meaning that uh, you, uh, which is something that happened back in the early COVID days, um, so basically if you are harvesting something which is more than 1% of total Twitter traffic, uh, at some point, the API shuts down. Uh, that is true for V1. I don't know if it's still true for V2, but I guess yes. Uh, or you could use it to gather tweets for seven days in the past. So you input me too in your program and you make it run in your program, and then you gather tweets for the previous week. Okay, after that, you have no way to gather data. Then you have the enterprise, which allows you to have full access to all of Twitter. So basically you get you can get the first post, pretty much every post that you can, but it's paid. Okay, and it costs a lot. I don't remember exactly how much because uh, Twitter pricing is not that transparent, uh, but it costs a lot. But at the same time, you can have um, apply as if you are a PhD student or if you are academic professional, you can apply for academic access to that. Meaning that that will give you a um, free version of enterprise, okay? Meaning that you can have your own streaming, 
which it does function like the regular one. I never use that, but uh, it's that. Uh, or you can use uh, search, uh, which in this case, uh, it's pretty powerful and um, and covers pretty much everything. So, um, take in mind that you have monthly allowances which rank by the millions, uh, but it's quite easy to consume it at all if you are researching something super massive, for uh, example, Black Lives Matter or Me Too or something like that. In this case, uh, another point is that V2 is quite buggy, but I would see in, in, in a couple of slides. Uh, and in this case, you have these packages, so search Python, Python Twitter, Twitter Stream, which are uh, early version of something that will capture quite functional, uh, though, um, or something that captures data coming from from uh, from V2, okay? Or you could do, which is something that I will uh, give you after this class, or you can write your own client, okay? Uh, it's pretty easy to do. It's literally like, I don't know, 50 lines of code to do that, uh, especially if you're doing a very, like, basic type of client. Uh, or you could write your own client, okay? So, um, a couple of things, okay. So, a couple of things to, about, about Twitter API. Um, okay, first one, you have a maximum month and couple said that. Um, you could use different operators, so I guess you're familiar with Boolean operators, We'll see better in a matter of minutes. Uh, but I'm also sharing in the chat this kind of. Uh, what is that? Okay. So you can see that you could use Boolean operators to specify your query. And this is something which is specific for V2. Uh, V1 has less and less and less. A capability to make complex queries, uh, but in this case you can use um, or so grumpy or cat. So that's the example they are they are making, or you can subtract that grumpy less cat. So it doesn't include negates cat. So it doesn't you don't want to include that, or you could run wild with a couple of with like tens, uh, dozens of different things. You can search for a keyword. You can search for an emoji in a body of tweet, which is something that is weirdly useful, especially say that you are going to estimate sentiment about something, and a good idea is that uh, to use positive emojis attached to that. Um, or you could make an exact phrase match, uh, you could uh, match anything from someone, say that you want to get all the Trump tweets or all the Obama tweets or whatever, um, and retweets of something. Uh, also, you can uh, um, specify the language. Okay, so here it is, uh, which is something that is super useful because, um, I mean, Twitter is, is theoretically georeferenced, meaning that um, tweets have um, a metadata that it's attached. Uh, basically describes the country or global position, so more correctly, uh, in which the tweet was made, but almost no one used it. So basically no one used that kind of thing. Uh, which may, um, meaning that if you want to know what people of a given part of the world are, say, are saying, uh, you need to rely on language which may be a mixed blessing. So if you're doing research in Italian or in Swedish, for example, you're pretty sure that everything that has been tweeted in Italian or in Swedish comes from Italy or Sweden, or from people that talk Italy or Swedish as a first language. But say that you want to know um, what British people are saying about something. And you, you cannot, so basically you can um, isolate tweets coming from Great Britain, 
but at the same time you will lo lose like 80 percent of your total so maybe more i don't know uh, meaning that you need to be super careful when you do so an example um don't know if ale already talked to you about that but back in the i mean back in the i mean beginning lockdown in italy which for those of you that are not italian was particularly strict um what we did is to gather data uh, for which basically every other computational social scientist was doing so uh gather data from from twitter on on, on covid um and then at some point we decided to compare with different countries um, and then and at some point, we decided to gather for tweets for, for so we took Italy, we took uh, Germany, and we took, uh, remember, France, okay? Um, and those are pretty fine cases to do. So German, okay, you can get cases out of Austria, for example, but still, the vast majority of tweets in German will be from Germany. Um, in the case of Italy, it's pretty much spoken only in Italy, and in case of France, yes, you can get Senegal, but still, France is most, uh, the hub for that. Um, well, when you go to Great Britain, I mean, English means that you need to account for tweets coming from the US, from Australia, from South Africa, uh, from all of, of the Anglosphere, meaning that you, we had a problem. We needed to uh, narrow down things and how we did that, and basically follow the medium, uh, meaning that people, in order to disambiguate if someone, so, 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 so end user of Twitter, uh, in order to, um, I don't know, uh, understand whether or an, a piece of news or an opinion was related to the British context as opposed to every other country in the in Anglosphere, um, they use specific hashtags, so COVID UK, for example. So we didn't gather data out of COVID with using COVID-19 or other hashtags which were related to COVID globally, but we selected specific hashtags, okay? Um, so that's how you deal with this kind of issue. Um, another thing that bears remembering, especially for those of you that are working with uh, Twitter data uh, is that um, V2 is a little buggy at this time. This is a bug that shares with a specific version of V1. Um, that means that when you gather data out of it, um, you receive text. Okay, but that text may be truncated if you have a retweet and the these retweet ha it's longer than uh, 120 characters okay this is a known bug that twitter knows very well um they say they are fixing it but it's been going on for a couple of years right now um but since the api also produces the text of a retweet this may be easily fixed okay so Basically, you write a piece of code that uh, says, verifies whether or not the tweet that you are uh, reading that moment, it's, it's, it's a retweet, you know, because it has retweet and at the beginning. And if it is, you use the text from another field. Okay. Uh, but still, uh, that is what I was referring to when I was... Uh, talking about the fact that you need to familiarize with data cleaning um, because that's 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 something if you, if you if you at some point if you were to let's say do some quantitative text analysis on the text field your result would be invalid because you have truncated text so that's okay it's not even sampled it's basically just truncated text okay so a couple of practical pointers before moving at to um, I don't know how many of you have um, a Twitter account and how many of you have uh, had some developer access to Twitter is anyone that has that level of access 
I have one. Okay, that's super good. Someone Not that else? I've used it. <laughs> uh, V1, I get. So you have been authorized a couple of years, maybe, um, ago. Um, I just got it this year, and I'm working with a, a programmer to get it. Mm. So we're working so out it's, together. It's, it's, it's V2. Maybe it's V2. I think it's a V2 because I, I signed on for that's research. Super. Okay. Okay. So that's the V2. Okay. But still, um, another thing. So V2 is kind of hard to get because you need the backing of an institution. You need to present a little bit of your research and you can get turned down. It happened to some friends of mine. Um, but uh, you can also get V1 is comparatively more easy to get. Okay. So in order to do that, um, let me check. Okay, that's it. In order to get authorized from, from um, I mean, let's make it uh, legacy access first. Uh, in order to get access, you need to do something like that. So you get to appstwitter.com. I don't know, I won't show you. And, okay, that's super good. Uh, and then after you get that, you get to click on create an app and then you will have a form. I'm, I'll show you because it's personal, but um, you click on that and you would um, get to respond a couple of answers. And um, then in, I guess it's a matter of days and you usually get, get approved for that. Um, I take in mind that after the whole Trump mess, Twitter is, has clamped down a little bit on, on, on authorization, and especially they have um, pretty much stringent, they used to authorize pretty much everything that came through, uh, but right now they do have um, pretty much strong uh, ethical review, which means that you are um, not allowed to uh, investigate any political preference at individual level or sensitive data, but again, that's not research, it's just something it's not good. Uh, you need to wait, and then you gather your keys and then you can use for, with your favorite code, I advise you to use TweetPy if you are a Python guy, which is like this. So basically it's, it's, it's uh, and the line is not super good. So it's a library that allows you to gather Twitter and it works with V1. So meaning that you either get um, let's say, streaming data or you get uh, the back seven days. Okay? And you can also do sort of interesting stuff. So um, investigate uh, whether or not a person has liked that page make network analysis. So it's still, uh, it's an old way of accessing Twitter, but it's super useful right now. I still use it for a couple of things that are better than V2. In the case of V2, um, the process is pretty much the same. Okay, I do have, um, what is that? No. In the case of V2, the process is pretty much the same. Okay. And you need to apply to get access and uh, um, it will, so here, I just post it in the chat. Um, and we'll take a more like through interview to get to that, to get to that point. Uh, and will take longer than a couple of days, but eventually the vast majority of people that have, I mean, uh, reasons to get access to academic tier, uh, they managed to got it. Okay. So why I'm saying you all of this, because we won't obviously have access to that in the course of this lesson, but you know that um, we would like to think of the summer school as a community, uh, meaning that I would be helped 
happy for you to experiment on your own and I will give you some pieces of code you can use to experiment and see that in, in a minute um, and uh, even after the summer school is closed so you do have our um, ways of contacting us uh, I advise you to I mean try to experiment on your own and if it works yes if it doesn't work so write me a couple of lines on email and I will make uh, the best effort to help you in unraveling what you have done. Uh, okay, so. Okay, so we were going to cover the, um, I'm going to show you um, how V2 works. And in order to do that, you don't need to do it right now, uh, but a good strategy, if you, you can do if you want to follow, though, uh, is to open a Colab account. So Colab, it's like, um, it's a Google service that allows you to run code on the cloud, uh, Python code. Uh, this specific version of Python is a notebook, which is a um, version which is optimized for showing and teaching and for simplicity also. Uh, I know that it can sound a little bit intimidating, uh, but it's, it's very simple, actually. Um, so, first thing first, I have to... Uh, I mean, uh, I have to give you the code, because otherwise you can't follow. Oh, nope. It doesn't allow me to share stuff. Okay, so. Quick way of doing that would be to copy. Uh, just stop sharing my screen for a little bit and to do something private. Okay, because I'm just uploading it on my drive and... Okay, so that's it, call up notebooks. Uh, be too bit better and then get link. Okay. Okay, so... Please, if you... Okay, that should work right now. So, uh, post it in the chat. Um, um, uh, link when you get, you can get the script that I'm going to show you. Uh, let me know if you can or cannot access that, 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 um, that link. Um, uh, but eventually, with the slides and everything will be given to you either through email or through email or will be available on the summer school github page which courtesy of Elir. um okay so again getting back to that um what is collab collab is a platform that allows you to run code on the cloud and it's pretty useful to experiment it's not a functional coding environment because especially if you are uh, actually doing something that requires a lot of um i mean time running time uh but we make do for an example okay so get to collab uh, which is usually uh is given you with a with a Gmail address. It's a matter of minutes to to uh, open a Colab account, and then you load. Sorry, my interface is in Italian, but so you load your stuff here. The, you select a V2 and open. Uh, also, my operating system is Linux, which I guess you're familiar with. Which basically, half of you will be. Uh, Mac users. Um, okay, so I'll just click on it. As soon as you've done that, especially if the line holds, we'll find out that you have this environment which is uh, 
basically like a Google documents, but you need to, uh, can use it to run code. Uh, I won't get into detail with the code because it would take, uh, I mean, just comment all of the code because it would take like an hour or so to do so. Uh, but um, see how it's arranging different sections. So these are called cells that you can uh, like run individually. So there's a set of instructions that you can give to, uh, I mean, to the runtime and, 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 and they do what inside those cells. So especially this first cell, it's imports, meaning that Python is a modular language, meaning that it has a core of functions, so stuff that it does, but the very, the vast majority of the stuff you need to import with specific um, subsection of the code which are not included in the core uh, which is are called packages okay in this case we are importing five packages uh, request JSON time CSV on OS which allows us to do different stuff so request it's the core of the thing and allows us to interface with the API okay the other do other stuff another thing you may want to notice when you work with collab is that um, you have this file thing so Colab exists, so a Colab instance exists for uh, as long as you have it open in your browser, okay? Um, meaning that when you close it, everything will be gone, okay? So you say, what's the point of doing that? The point is that you can extract data and pass it to uh, other, other uh, CSV files or other formats that you can actually download and 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 uh, and uh, I mean take it with you okay in this case another thing I want you to show in this code okay this is a function that are little bits of code that do stuff you shouldn't be concerned about that uh, but there is some part of the code that you should be concerned about which is those lines okay these and these lines um, okay meaning what Remember what I said that API, uh, so you need to be authorized from Twitter in order to get your, your, um, your password, basically. So the whole authorization of, 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 um, of um, well, the authorization business means that when you have, have been approved from Twitter, uh, they will give you a password that you can use to, to, to access the API. So every code that you write should include that password in a very specific way to let Twitter know that you are you, okay? Uh, is personal. Theoretically, you shouldn't share with anyone. So that's the reason why I'm not visualizing that. Uh, but I mean, if you are in a research group, so feel free to share the password, okay? The second part, it's what we are going to search. Okay, I know that this sounds super esoteric, uh, but um, the idea of making uh, also groups like that author authoritatively is that we wanted to include uh, someone who has a little bit of programming knowledge in its, gr in its group so uh, that person can help others to understand and also I'm here to help you understand everything if you need. Um, you won't need this for the the... the I mean, your project, uh, you not specifically need it. If you can use it, that's good. Um, but again, this is something that you will do later on. Okay, query is the thing that you have, um, we have this, this discussing previously, sorry, it's in Italian, uh, gatti means cats. Um, oh, I needed something very stupid that doesn't generate a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, I mean, tweets, because otherwise it would take so, so long. Uh, and then this is a very simple um, query. So gatti, langit, means that we want to get everything which has been written in Italian that includes the word gatti. We could do like that. So hashtag gatti. We could do something like that. Or, or cani, dogs. Okay, or cats, let's go like that, so it's more international. 
Okay, so meaning that we are going to search for something which includes the hashtag Gatti cats or the word, the English word cats. And we we're going to do that in Italian. I just stick to Gatti because otherwise it's, I don't know. They're just making an example of cats. Um, this is the file name. You are going to uh, save the data. So see that those are variable and those are what's inside the variable. So these are string variables, meaning that you need to, um, I mean, their value is in single or double brackets. Okay, so something like this also works. Okay, uh, meaning that uh, every value you give after the equal sign should be in brackets because otherwise the code won't work. Okay, um, then you leave it, this like it is because it's hard to complicate to explain you what that is. Uh, but basically that's the way you get to access your password because it would need to be stored in a separate file for safety. Um, then you have query parameters, uh, which if I were you, I wouldn't touch for my first try with that uh, because it, they deal with the kind of metadata that, that, that the script extracts. Oh, by the way, this is my scripts. Feel free to use whichever uh, there are better versions of it. I just want to show you that because, I don't know, whatever. It's, it's, it's uh, my contribution to the field. Um, one thing you may want to, um, to modify, though, is the start and end time. So those are both strings, so you should modify those things, those parts, Okay, uh, and they need to be spelled like this, which is a rather weird way of spelling a date, which is year, uh, day, and month, which is uh, apparently the weirdest way you can, but that's the standard in American computer science. Um, and then you have T, which is a marker, and then it's time. So meaning that uh, you get tweets that beginning from 2012, 6th of May, okay, uh, and then up to 2000, um, 2021, 1st uh, of May, from midnight to midnight, okay. Um, it begins, um, it may be relevant at some point, but it begins gathering team tweets from the end. So it starts from the most recent tweets and it gets to the most, to the older, okay? If at some point your code breaks up. Um, okay, so in order to make it function, you need to have uh, a BT file, um, a file which is, contains your password. Um, and then I'll show you an example as soon as we close the registration because that contains my actual password right now. Um, so what you do is to take, drag and drop your file here. And then I need to authorize it, yes. Okay, so um, trust me for that subject. This, well, your password, it needs to be formatted in a very specific way, which is super simple, which is, um, Oh, the kind of password that that um, you may want because Twitter will give you a number of passwords uh, that you can use to access a number of different points of the API. What you want to use is a bearer token, what is called a bearer token, which is a very long half uh, alphanumeric password that Twitter at some point will give you. Um, so you need to click on this folder here, which is your local files. So the files that are available for the scripts to make it work. Um, and then what you do, and they need to be formatted in a very peculiar way, which I will sh show you after the registration is done, the recording is done. Um, so then you execute each cell. So you click on this, um, I mean, triangle here, or you uh, click shift and, and, and enter, so as I'm doing right now. Okay, each cell will execute. If something is wrong, uh, so make an example like that, you will receive an error message.
Okay. Which in this case says, hey, we don't have that file. The name is different. Okay, and then you have your query. Search for Gatti. And then you execute your query. Uh, with any luck, should be beginning right now. So you see it's pretty slow. So what you have here are, are um, actually, um, so they're visualizing the first tweet in every batch. So the way the script works is um, takes 200 tweets at a time and then, and then uh, basically saves in a CSV file. Okay. So uh, it visualizes the first of the batch in order to let you know that the script is still alive. So I'm a little bit paranoid on that regard. Um, okay. So I'm just terminate it because we don't have a lot of time. And then you have the Gatti. Okay, you can download it. Uh, yay, it's not downloading it. Or you can also open it, right? Yeah, so basically what you will have, it's standard CSV, so author ID created that, so it's there's a bunch of columns that uh, I don't know why it is not downloading. Um, so it's a bunch of columns that that have all of the uh, metadata and the text and whatever. So uh, okay. So getting to the other point. So how you get to use um, V1? Um, I'm also including, um, and I will include later on because right now we need to hurry a little bit um i will also provide you with uh, um a script that works with with the v1 which may be more practical for you uh in order to get authorized to v1 I'll show you that you need to be um registered in twitter as soon as you are registered um we'll find out that the script is done like that so you will have a section, pretty much the one in V2, but in this case, you will have four passwords, okay? So access token, access token, secret consumer, key consumer, key secret. Um, that is why, I mean, the way it worked, uh, the way the way uh, V1 worked, okay? Uh, those four passwords will be provided to you by Twitter, um, and so in order to get those, what you should do after you completed your registration. So Twitter says, well, hello, welcome to the family. You have completed your registration. Uh, you need to go to your account, uh, especially you need to go to developer.twitter.com, which you do have the link in chat. Um, and then you go, you will find out that you have this weird looking panel, which is unlike the one they use for Twitter. And then you have app details, keys and token and permission. So for each of the app, you will click on your app. So at some point, I'll um, ask you to name your app, and you will go to keys and token, and then you will have password there. So it's possibly that you need to generate those passwords the first time. I don't remember, it's been like a lot of time since I have accessed that, that part of my Twitter account. But the point is that either you generate those or are already there for you. So and these go to your script. Okay, so these go to these parts here. So access token, access token, consumer key, consumer secret. Uh, names may diverge, but you will find the translation in your in these slides. And then it works exactly like the scripts that you've seen from, from, uh, from V2. So you have a bunch of lines, you shift click every one of those. Uh, and then after you have done that, uh, you will find your results to um, in, 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 in uh, let's say, the file name that you, so basically this file name here. So file name test v2, in this case you have test v2, which will contain your results. Uh, by the way, uh, this is not, I mean, a standard way of doing stuff. This is just, just something that I want to show you because it's the easiest way of accessing Python code because otherwise it would take them to install Python, install dependencies, and that would have taken us several hours to do so. Uh, but if you want to install Pandas, I advise you to use this 
specific kind of distribution, which includes uh, so this one. Okay, so get into the chat again. Uh, it's Google uh, Hosan. Is Google Cola better to use a Jupyter notebook? They're basically the same stuff. Um, the point is that Cola is collaboratory, as the name says. It's a version of of uh, Jupyter Notebook. The point is uh, that you don't basically already includes all of the most popular packages, um, meaning that you don't need to install stuff usually unless you're doing something super weird, especially if you're doing data science kind of things. It's already there. Uh, if you need to install the API package to interface with TikTok, well, basically you need to install it with pip, for example. Uh, but they're the same stuff. Okay, thanks. Um, no problem. Um, so advise you to use Anaconda, which is a super good distribution, which is geared toward data science. Uh, it has a lot of different solutions, also has other things. Uh, it has Python, it uh, has R, as Orange, and I think they also added Watson at some point, uh, but this is beyond this class. Um, okay, so, um, and, and I will give you the, 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 the script to use to V1 as soon as you get, uh, we'll have the script right now, but we'll need to take some time to gather your author, authorization from Twitter. So let's go back to scraping, uh, which won't have any, any example, um, but um, I need to, you to understand the other way you can get data out of, out of digital, uh, digital pages. Uh, and in order to do that, I need you to familiarize with what is a web page. So probably the vast majority of you will know that uh, every website, so every, every website that you visit is powered by HTML code, which is a markup language that disciplines uh, whatever you get to experience on a web page. So it's I mean, HTML slash and then A for a link and then BR for a break and whatever. Uh, usually, and that what we, we refer to static websites at those websites that never change. So think about, uh, I'm old enough to have experienced web 1.0 which was basically a, start, a page with a collection of links, some text, some images, some links, and that is the most basic web page you can do. Uh, oh, a good example is Scarufi, maybe. No. Um, which is, I mean, comparatively uncommon these days, uh, especially if you're dealing with platforms. So uh, platform works a little different. So everything still gets visualized by HTML code, uh, but they do have uh, scripts that are producing the code as you require it. So, um, I mean, think about Facebook, for example. Facebook doesn't, it's not a collection of static pages, meaning that if you click on a page, uh, the server does not have in memory that the static version of that page. So the H, the actual HTML code with, uh, I know you want to Google the page of Obama, for example, and then they have the actual HTML code, which title, uh, bracket title, this is the web Facebook of Obama, and then uh, Pierre, and then you have the first post, and then you have the second post, and yada, yada, yada. So um, it would be totally impractical to do so. so basically impossible to do so. So how does Facebook manage to get that page shown to you? Uh, it has some server-side technology, meaning that is a database in which your data storage, and this is like an interesting sample for research. Uh, and then as soon as you call the that web page, I mean, the Facebook page of Obama, uh, in, your browser queries the server that queries the data that produces the HTML code on the fly. So what you're seeing is not actually pre-existing HTML code, but it's code that has been generated by uh, 
scripts in other programming languages, PHP or JavaScript are the most, or ASP, if someone still uses ASP, Ajax, and those kind of things that generate the code that you will see. This happened in microseconds. Uh, basically, it, it's what happened when you see a page loading, okay? Um, okay, so after that, you may have some client-side scripts, which is the pieces of code that are embedded in the page uh, or partially embedded in the page that get executed on your part. So that is basically what deals with cookies, uh, deals with last minute tweaks to the page. And they get executed by your browser and then eventually uh, you get to see the, the, the results of that. Uh, a website that does a lot of that is TripAdvisor, which is can, why is that so hard to scrape? Um, which basically, uh, I mean, use a lot of that. And so the web page you see, it's, it's a collection of all those things. Um, we can classify pages um, on their, how, how difficult they are to scrape uh, based on what, uh, it's a part that does the heavy lifting of that. And where are the data that you want to access? So let's make, make an example. So in order to, um, so the easier part, so the simple case for scraping is that when you want something that has been generated um, from the server side, okay? So, um, so on a good example, is a Wikipedia page. Okay, what else? So basically. Okay, Wikipedia is totally scrapable uh, because they don't, they're a charity and they're not interested in making money, so they're not interested in, in restricting your access to, to their thing. Obviously, I think that they do also have pretty powerful API, so it's the best idea to work, to use, use API if they're available. Uh, it was, I mean, it's a nicer way of doing stuff. Um, but if the data that you want to, um, if you want to analyze, it's already embedded in, in, the, in the HTML code, but well, you're, you're for an easy job, okay? How you know if it's easily embedded? You can do that, so assuming that you use Firefox, but it's the same with Chrome, uh, what you want to do is to analyze it. So select something, so select this text, and then you analyze. So open the analyzer, meaning that will show you the code that's it's generating that that thing. Um, so basically, this is the code. The most agreement the 24th, Punic Republic, and yada, yada, yada. So it's this is the text with the formatting, with the links that uh, you can click on and everything. So say that you have a research question, a very silly research question that requires you to uh, access this, this uh, article, and that would be pretty easy to scrape, okay? Uh, Meaning what? Meaning that if you are in this case, what you do, uh, obviously it, it, it requires you to write some code, uh, which I advise you to experiment and then get your hand dirty. Uh, uh, and that means that you use a request, which is a packages from Python that you've seen that we use before for, for V2, uh, which interface, it's an interface with, with, with websites. No, that, let's take it like that. Then after you got the data, so you query the website says, well, I want to visualize you. Okay, that's what request does. Uh, then the website responds to you, giving you the HTML code. But the point is that HTML code is, un is readable to human, but it's very hard to read. And it's, I mean, many lines long and would be totally crazy to parse it by hand, meaning that you could use a parser. Uh, the one I advise to use is called Beautiful Soup. Okay, so it's this one, which is a piece of software that, um, I mean, reads the HTML for you and extracts the data that you want. It's not that uh, easy to use. It's not that super complicated either, uh, but it takes some practice. Uh, and by the way, um, I will give you some links to practice your Python if you're interested into that. You can write to me, I can, uh, maybe I can let Ilir uh, upload in the, 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 let's say, the GitHub 
collection of links that you can use to to improve your Python or learn Python. Uh, and then parse extract the data and you get the data on the CSV and you're super happy. Uh, but it comes the hard way of doing that. So a complex case in scraping is that uh, when you want something that is generated at your browser level, so hypothetically it's, it, it, it's super, um, it, when they generate the thing at last mile. So meaning that if you open um, exactly like that, you have to see through requests, but if you open the HTML, you don't find, um, you can do it by your browser because if you do it by your browser, by definition, your browser has already processed that. But if you do it through requests through Python and you don't see that kind of object, um, so say that you want this link, okay? If you open this through Python and you don't find this link present means that uh, that link is, will be generated through a JavaScript in your own browser. Meaning what? Meaning that you need to leverage that to get to the data. Um, so basically scraping in Python has nuclear, what they call a nuclear option, which is Selenium, which is this kind of piece of software here. Which is rather, rather, rather complicated. Uh, but um, what it does, Selenium, it's a browser emulator, meaning that it automizes your browser. It's like having another person actually using your browser. And in some cases, is exactly like that, uh, especially, but the person is a bot, let's say. Um, and then what it does, it emulates the action of people. Uh, using your browser, so it opens um, a web page uh, and you see it open if you're using a specific configuration of Selenium, you also see it open. And I say as well, you have to scroll the page down because that's uh, probably what the page needs to generate the data that you want, uh, especially you have websites that have a what is called an infinite scrolling. Um, I mean, Republica is a good example, sorry, it's it's in Italian. Uh, which is an Italian newspaper, and then it's newspaper, and then you see that you have this page uh, which generates a lot of stuff. And then if you go down, you will see that it's like a loading time. So at some point, you see, I did that. So you scroll down, you see that, especially if you do it very fast, you see that it's loading content. Why is doing that? Because it's... It, it, um, I mean, it's your browser that is generating that. So it's, as long as you're scrolling down, the browser, what it's doing is, is uh, keeps calling the server, says, well, I got to the end of the page. Uh, there's more content. The browser, the server says, yes. And so give me more content. And then, then it uses it to visualize your page. Um, if you want to scrape something like this, you need Selenium. Because if you were to scrape the static version, so the one that, that gets you loaded, uh, you won't get to the, to the, to the end. Okay, so you won't get access to that, which is uh, like, I mean, commercial content and why we want to get to that. Uh, another good example would be, which is more uh, socially, uh, social research minded, would be uh, TripAdvisor in some cases, uh, in the comment, for example, or Booking, for example. Um, early version of Pinterest and Instagram use this kind of you know, techniques. Uh, but basically a lot of websites use that. Um, so if you want to, that content, you need to automate your browser and you need to do it with Selenium. That's super advanced technique for scraping, but just letting you know that exists. Uh, so so but what, what is my message? You can get pretty much whatever you want. Uh, it's a function of the, I mean, the length of time that you want to go to actually gather that data. Okay, so that's basically that's the whole life cycle. So you use Selenium and then Selenium automates your browser and then you get to do as it was for the previous stuff. So you use a parser, beautiful soup or also Selenium hard parsing capabilities and then you extract the data and then you're happy because you have, to, you have the data, okay. Other example you may want to use, so this is, um, 
the packages that you may want to explore with scraping, I advise you to scrape very basic pages uh, at the beginning. If you want to experience these kind of things are pages that are especially uh, designed to teach you scraping. Uh, so that these is, they would be your, I mean, initial tools to, 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 to do everything. Another good example, which won't um, get into detail because it's already late, uh, it's Netlytic, but I guess that the lot of you already know Netlytic. Um, so allows you to get some data out of uh, Twitter, out of uh, no, Facebook, not anymore, uh, Instagram, maybe. Uh, it would be useful to make a quick peek, for example, uh, but eventually if you get manage to get access to, but in the case of Twitter, for example, it extracts uh, a sample, which I think is uh, 10,000 at, at the most. Um, and so that's it. it's not super useful, but just letting you know. But it has a couple of, of interesting features that you may want to exploit by using your data, can do some preliminary data processing, so removing of stop words, for example. Uh, you can also you do use it for doing uh, network analysis, although I advise you to learn and use Gephi for that purpose. Um, and that's it. Another way you might want, another thing that you may want to use is Node Excel, which is known, I mean, not something that I usually use, but is an extension for Excel that allows you to gather data and make some uh, quite good uh, network analysis with that. Okay, but again, uh, using API plus Gephi beats that, and it's also free. Another way, um, I mean, I think that I, advise you to get access to, but may be rather complicated, is CrowdTangle, um, which again, let me pause sharing a little bit. Okay. Because I need to access with my account. Okay, yes. Okay, let me resume the sharing. Okay, so uh, the first thing you should see when you get to Groutangle is something like that. You log in and you usually, ask after you have completed your authorization, you will use your Facebook account to get to that. Uh, Uh, then, when, after you log in, you find out the dashboard that allows you to, uh, meaning, know the posts that you've done. Uh, but so you have a commercial part of that, which is not something we are concerned about. Uh, what we want to do is the search part. So you get to search, and then um, you see this is a rather powerful instrument. Uh, so and you want to search some things. You search cats. Okay, because that's I'm I'm obsessed, um, and then you can search it for Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, or Twitter. But Twitter requires you to give it your keys um, to authorize it. And again, it's better that you use uh, the API so you have the time and skill to get authorized on, on CrowdTangle. So basically, you need to already had authorization of API, so it's kind of redundant. Uh, you can get Posts from Facebook pages, public groups, or verified profiles. As we said, you don't have access and you shouldn't have access to uh, individual posts because they're private. Okay. Uh, but you can select whatever you want. So verified profiles and those kind of things. Okay. And then you can get to uh, select the time frame you want, last 60 minutes, or like that. So how many people are talking about cats in? in the last five minutes uh, or last 30 days. And you see the total number of posts and interaction here, okay? And it may take some time to load. Yeah, 
get to share what you want, uh, sub sample of pages that you want to use, a language, uh, Italian, whatever. Okay. Oh, oh my God, this is super creepy. This cat is super creepy. Um, and then you get to export the CSV that will be mailed to you in your personal mail that you use to register. Um, okay, so that concludes Crowd Tangle. It's a super powerful instrument uh, that has a lot of metadata. So you will get pretty much everything that you have here on the post. Um, so title, date, uh, text, and then interactions, so the kind of links that they have um, that they have in the posts, uh, so all, all of that. And uh, while uh, we used to enjoy uh, better access with NetFeeds, um, that was super good, uh, but I already told to you that how NetFeeds has died, uh, so we uh, can use uh, CrowdTangle, which is a super good exam, super good uh, tool to, to make research. It's not that through what NetFeeds was. But again, we're dealing with commercial platform. This part of the problem that they have ownership of your data, basically. Um, so that's it. Okay, so getting back to other stuff. Um, cover that. Um, I guess you already already experienced YouTube as a data tool, so you will do with with. Um, uh, with Ale Gandini tomorrow. Uh, I just wanted to signal to you that is a super good, uh, I mean, example to, to uh, I mean, I think it's the best tool that I have on DMI and super performing, uh, uh, have a lot of different models that can I mean, gather data out of videos, channel network and those kind of things, but that's, I guess that Gandini will touch on that. Um, Another thing I wanted to show you is Media Cloud. Um, meaning that it's, Media Cloud is, is um, something that, I don't know how many of you have known and used Media Cloud, but it's something that's super powerful and a few people use up to this day. It's a service that allows you to gather news headlines in, in um, for basically every kind of online content that uh, has been indecised into Media Cloud, but I can assure you that's a lot of it. Um, and it's super powerful, especially if you are wanting to cross-reference social media data with the legacy media data, okay? Um, so, the thing is that, let's show you how Media Cloud is done. Um, you need to register at some point, but they're fairly liberal with their memberships. Um, I didn't hear of anyone that was being uh, rejected from Media Cloud. So go on the website and click on launch now. And then you log in. Uh, no, I'm already logged in. And what you want to do is the Explorer. I mean, they have three services, a source manager, topic mapper, and explorer. Explorer is the one you're interested in, so um, feel free to explore the other one, but the most powerful is explorer. Uh, say that you want to, again, I don't know. No, no, not COVID, please. Um, sorry, again, this the topic of the day, gatti cats. Um, and you click on search, and then you have this old thing, uh, also, you can use Boolean queries, so get or dog, canny dogs, those kind of things. Uh, so this is your search term, so gatti and canny, okay? And you get to choose what kind of media you want. Um, I mean, you want to investigate, so add media. Um, you have a lot of collections, so each of these is... Uh, a collection of media of some kind. So you have US top newspapers, and if you click on it, uh, 
you'll open it source manager and see what's inside that. Arkansas Democrats got there at the central Baltimore Sun, so they are um, I'm not familiar with the use media sphere, but I guess that those are quite popular uh, newspapers. So getting back to the thing, you have geographic collection, which is probably the first thing they should be interesting to, uh, because I want, I'm Italian, I want to learn something about Italy and uh, get to search for Italy. Okay. So you have different, um, different subsection. So you see pretty powerful and extensive. Uh, in this case, we will use Italy National, which is media that talk about Italy at a national level. You have state and local, which is more or less the same, but the more focus on the on the local level. So it's local news, for example. And then you have uh, subsections of that country, in this case, Lombardia, Lazio, Piemonte, probably if you were to look for the US, you have individual states. Uh, then what you can do is just click on this plus and then okay and that's probably you remove united states because not a lot of news would talk about gatti in the uh you enter your search dates which is usually around one month uh but it can be pretty much whatever you want uh, it's fairly powerful as i said and then you get to search for it it would take some time and then you see the attention over time so the number of uh, newspapers that have mentioned the word gatti or, and the cani, so cats or dogs, uh, in time. So we have the peak here, 25%, um, 0.25% of story as Gatti and Cani. I don't know what, why that's so. Um, and then you get to download uh, total attention, so 117. Uh, get to download options and you get to download the CSV file with that. So may take some time. To do that, especially if you're doing for larger uh, queries, for example, if we were to search for COVID, for example, let me show what happens. No, pretty quick. So 27%, so you see the difference. And then you see that 430,000 uh, articles have, you know, talk about COVID in the last month. Um, so get to download the stuff and then uh, Gatti and Kami. And you see something like that. Okay. Uh, this is okay. So I'm a little bit obsessed with that. Uh, okay, so we what you get it's stories ID, which is a new identifier that the published date. So when that it was published, uh, the title, oh, okay. So something about cats and dogs, obviously, sorry, it's in Italian. Uh, the title of that, uh, the URL. So you get to, you can click on that. You don't have the actual content. Oh, why it's not working? Okay, because it's fine like that okay so it's very glum which is about pet cemetery uh and it's not about the ramon song um okay so you you don't have as was saying you don't have uh the the um, i mean the whole text because I mean, for copyright reasons uh but you get the link which is if you're doing qualitative analysis pretty much what you need. Uh, language, whether or not it's syndicated from Associated Press, uh, themes, which is almost inevitably empty, empty, especially if you do things which is not based on the US. The media ID, uh, which is a kind of newspaper, this is a code of newspaper, uh, the media name and media URL that run that news. Okay, so from these you can eventually gather the text or you can do all sorts of nasty stuff with this knowledge um okay so we still have like an hour to get to um so and i have a couple of things to show you again i can show you how you do data cleanup either manually or or or, or with python um 
I guess that it's better if we start with, um, or maybe it's better if we, if we dedicate some time to the inevitable questions. So if you are comfortable with that, what I would do, it's uh, I would skip the manual cleanup of files uh, because it's in the slides. If you want to do it, uh, basically what it takes is that you to, I mean, use text column and pivot tables, which I guess you are familiar with. Um, if not, you need to be familiar with. Uh, so since we have, I want to dedicate a, a couple of minutes to, um, I mean, inevitable questions uh, and clari clarifications, uh, what I propose to you is that we deal with basic analysis in Python, okay? Um, you can, we'll have the slides so you can do this on your own. You cannot, are not able to do that, but still you need to be pretty proficient in, in um, pivot tables to do this kind of job. Um, okay, so again, we're talking about collab. Okay, so again, uh, let me close this one and open again. Okay, so again, you will need to, there is a file, which I will give you, no, it's not here, it's here, uh, which is called operations, which we will see in detail, um, which it's, I mean, this is very specific. This file is very specific. It's just an example of something you can do. And it will work um, with data that comes from Twitter API v2, uh, which is, been formatted the way it has been formatted for the two groups that are doing Twitter. Okay, so sorry that I cannot accommodate for the others, uh, but again, mm, I mean, programming requires that you uh, systematize things, and so formatting data is a way of systematizing things. Uh, okay, so. Again, you need to open it up in, in Colab, which in this case, it's already done. Okay, and you need to feed them the kind of data that you want to analyze. In this case, we are using to uh, analyze the AstraZeneca sample, okay, which is in, in Excel. Okay, line by line. Sorry, I need to blow my nose. No wife, I keep headphones for more than an hour. I get, get I'm getting my, na my nose closed down. Um, okay, so as you remember, you need to import your, I mean, stuff in, in the, in the this column, okay, uh, that that you have it so so that 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 column has it on your runtime. So get line by line, okay. So this is an import, meaning that we're going to import pandas, which is this. It's a collection of packages. It's a package, but it's a very large one, uh, which allows you to. Uh, do all kind of data analysis stuff. So organize data in your data frame, uh, make descriptive analysis and do merge and melt and whatever, pretty much every, everything you can do with data, uh, you can do it with pandas. Maybe a little intimidating and complex to use because I use a different syntax than Python. It's more similar to R for those of you that have are familiar with with R, um, it's pretty much similar to, to, to R as in its syntax, but it's less crazy. Um, okay, so first line, we need to import pandas as PT, meaning that uh, we will use uh, that, that to access our data. Second line, we use our data as an input and 
we put it in a data frame. What's the data frame? Uh, the data frame is exactly like this. So see, when you name a variable, it produces what's inside that variable. In this case, a data frame is a table which includes um, Twitter text. Okay, in our case, it's it's a data, it's a data frame about, about Twitter. Uh, so every row is a tweet and every column is a different piece of data that gets associated with that tweet. So you have the author ID, which is the um, um, kind of an alpha, it's a numeric identificator uh, for each author. Um, so it's kind of a, your a new, unique key to, to I mean, get to know who is who in that context. Uh, and then you have which at which time it was created, the, 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 the tweet was created, uh, and then you have the text, but remember that um, it's truncated, so you may have an issue with that. Um, it's zero, but you see none. None means that we don't have the data. It's not a number. It's a convention of pandas, um, meaning that we don't have data for that. So almost inevitably, no one uses geographic information anymore. Language, which is by definition English, because the data set was captured in English. Uh, public metrics, which is kind of a tweet count for the original tweets, a couple of things that uh, are attributes of the tweets, but they're already here. Okay, so reply count is actually a retweet count. Um, ID uses screen name, screen name, retweeted status, which is text that have been retweeting, and you have the retweeted author, and then you have full text, okay? Which is, full text is something that is not, not given you by the API, but it's something that I, I have inserted into, into the data set because it um, resolves that bug that I was talking about. So basically, if you looking at the groups that are going to do Twitter later on, uh, if you need to, I mean, use a column of text to do stuff, use full text, please, because that's the one that does not any kind of bug. Um, sorry. You know. it's, it's, yes. So. so when we were looking at this yesterday, um, uh, sorry, can you go back to, <laughs> to not me? No, yes, 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 sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, no. Yes, that's um, it. Okay. So um, when you look at the public metrics, it says the retweet yes. count is 501, right? Yes. The, the, so so the, what I understood it to mean was the original tweet was retweeted 501 times. Yes, yes. But then each individual time it was retweeted, those single unique uh, tweets were quoted or retweeted so the first one was zero times is that correct yes is that correct okay. uh the point is that you shouldn't rely on that okay um so it bears a little explaining that uh this is referred to the original tweet okay um and it's different if he, if the tweet you see that the first one is a retweet because it's a rc and the second one is not a retweet and has not been retweeted, so zero, okay? Uh, if you were to isolate this thing, which is at some point, it's somewhere in the database, uh, we will find out that at the time uh, when it was tweeted, it was zero. So it, it's referred at that time. But the point is that this uh, column is rather confusing. Uh, as a matter of fact, I need to uh, cancel from my script uh, because if you want to know how, because by definition, so you, you're working with a sample, so things are a little different here. But by definition, when we work with something, remember what I said in the beginning, that we work with the whole data set. Uh, but because we're working with the whole data set, so we work with everyone that has written something about AstraZeneca in this case, um, in order to know which is the most retweeted count, um, content, you ju just need to counter tweets. So that's the best way of doing that. Uh, so see that you have a column which is retweeted status or retweeted author. So basically what you do is count that column. So you have a set of instruction which will be uh, here, for example, and that's how we do it. You basically just ignore this column, okay? I know you said you thought it was confusing, but I thought it was actually, I've worked with another data set that was, mm -hmm. um, less clear this was actually very clear because mm. um when you want to see 
how um, a narrative is developing, actually you can, uh, it, this allowed me to see that there was a retweeted author and this was actually a very important tweet that was okay. retweeted. So I, I liked it. I just needed to have it. Explained. Okay. No, I, I guess it depends on the kind of research question that you have. Um, I myself usually do that way, but if you have sp yeah. very specific questions that, so my, my, my idea is, um, Obviously, you, you are into a trade-off because the more column you put in, into a data set, uh, the more heavy it will be, especially if you're dealing with text column, which is something that almost every column is in a Twitter data set. Uh, so basically, if you add a text, a full text column, it can I mean, uh, increase your data set uh, by 30%. 30-40% so it depends because uh, text column is rather heavy. If you work with million on that data points that means that you have uh, especially seen with the AstraZeneca data set which is 1.2 gigabytes okay and it's rather smallish because if you were to investigate for example uh, Black Lives Matter we probably would deal with uh, something in the range of terabytes okay so um, when I produce um, a data set, my idea is to, I mean, include columns uh, because other people may have different, as, as you did, uh, other people may have different uses of that, even if I don't see that, but at the same time, just to keep it, I mean, I mean, compacted because otherwise it would explode uh, in terms of, of, of data size. Uh, in this case, I included text and retweeted text and full text, which is something super stupid to do. Uh, but I mean, I did it for I mean, didactical purposes. So you could see the difference between these and also just try to remake the same thing. That was um, also interesting though, the retweeted status, which is, or, or mm, no, wait, the text. So that you have the text and the full text. Mm -hmm. So some of the, the, uh, tweets had empty text or something like that. So um, if you quote, if you quote a text, it'll actually be different. You'll have more text, right? Yes. Yes. And if yes. you add a hashtag above the quoted text, that'll appear uh, in the text, but not the full text. So you can see how they added certain things right. That's and you can, clever. and you can actually study the differentiation. What did they supplement to the original tweet in order to um, uh, bring it into a view of certain groups, right? Using hashtags. Yes, so I, yes, I, yes, I yes, yes. That's, that's, that's super clever. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, there's something that needs to be implemented in that, in that, in that, in this script because you, it's, it's still a beta. Uh, yes, there's something that needs to be implemented right now. Yes. Can I, sorry, one more question. Um, yes, please. I Go didn't ahead. notice any link to the specific tweet. Is that via ID then? Or, because I've worked with the data set that would have uh, the, the You can that. use the ID to link back to the tweet, but um, would take some time, um, meaning that you need to, um, oh, let me just make an example. Oh, just one tweet at random. It's Pride Month. So you see what happens. So it's the URL of a tweet. Okay. Uh, so see how it's shaped. If you can increase that a bit. Okay. So see how it's shaped obviously not because you need to let's get back to the tweet um so how it's done so twitter.com slash per tendenza which is the um, name of the account and then you get status and then you get the the um, the id everything is in is in the script so you see what happens uh, no it's here uh no actually it's, it's oh a collab yes no what is that sorry i just lost my ah, here it is um so you have 
the ID of the tweets and you have the person that have produced that, that tweet. So you basically can compose that um, and you can retrieve the URL. Um, yes, it's something, as I said, it's, 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 it's a beta version. Uh, may include that, especially because that is kind of a blind spot because I don't do much um, qualitative assessment of tweets anymore uh but if you do that uh that would be useful obviously uh or you could uh, just search for the text which is something that almost inevitably produces the tweet we are looking into unless it's super generic okay but yes uh the actual url is a combination of those things um and you can easily done that with with uh, so i mean doing like right now so yeah thank thank you that would that helped all right so like that if you do something like that it's df um so http like that and then like that like that and then plus it's concatenated uh slash uh, the name so use a screen name like that um and plus like that and then the id i guess it works sorry if it doesn't but something like this and it should work nope why done Ah, okay, because I need plus seven here. No. Uh, okay, no, it's I need to catch the exception, so it needs to be more complicated than that because it contains nuns and I need to uh okay, I need to um okay, nope. Um we'll just release an uh we'll just give you a a version that does that for you. Okay, um, because I need to uh, address some exceptions that are in the, the data frame. Okay, so this is your data frame, and these are your columns. So basically, it's what's inside your data set. The one thing you could do is the first thing that I usually do when I deal with with um, Twitter data is to uh, assess their diffusion. Okay, so. The best way of doing that is to uh, have an activity chart. Okay, so what this kind of cell does is that um, produces, uh, it transforms the date, which is a string variable, into a date. Uh, this is what parses the date and replaces a couple of things, so shouldn't be too much concern about that. And then use that as an index of the data frame. So you see what happens if we now assess the data frame. Uh, FT. So you see that right now, before we had this numeric index, now we have the date. Okay. Uh, meaning that then we can count on this line um, how how many tweets are in each day, and we can as observe that the fifteenth we have a lot of tweets about AstraZeneca. I don't know why because I don't have the the I mean the knowledge of that, uh, but still that's 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 what happens. <laughs> Um, you can also resample into dif at different levels, so you can do weeks, for example. Okay, you can do months, even if in this case we have just two months, but you usually get stick it with days or hours, but in this case it would be an unreadable mess uh, if we use hours. Uh, and then it exports here to day counts. Okay, uh, and then you can open it as we've seen before. Take some time to do that. Or you could download 
but in my case it doesn't work, but you know, we'll uh, guess it's a Linux Firefox thing. Uh, then another preliminary analysis is that you get to count uh, the retweeted authors and value counts, and then you get to save it with um, RTA accounts. Okay. And then again, so you see that it should appear any minute now. Nope. Okay, that's it. Uh, and then if you click on that, if you just, um, maybe best if you do like that. Okay, so you see how, uh, which are the names of the people that, accounts that have been tweeting about, about, uh, in AstraZeneca, and surprisingly, the top most is Reuters, and you have Sky News, and you have Reuters Health, uh, okay, New York Times, so you have a lot of, um, lot of news media, and probably some of these would be journalists. Then you have most retweeted texts, which is more or less the same. Um, so we get to, And then you get the most retweeted hashtags. So these are all beginning phases that you may want to know a data set better so that you may end up doing whatever you want with a data set. Uh, but if you do this first, you're actually going to uh, experience it. So, so let me ha let help you formulate a question know your data set better. So you know that uh, AstraZeneca, which we didn't use with an hashtag, unsurprisingly correlates with AstraZeneca as an hashtag. Okay, yes, that's super clever. Um, and then again, it relates with COVID vaccine breaking, because as in breaking news, COVID vaccine, the end poly, I don't know what that, that is. Uh, maybe politics, coronavirus and COVID vaccine. Um, COVID-19, then Pfizer, all kind of stuff. Uh, this is super useful, uh, by the way, if you are, I mean, looking into sideways hashtag that allow you to understand whether or not um, you've been capturing something, right? Uh, meaning that you may have minority hashtags. So good example is that you, if you were researching Black Lives Matter, for example, and then at some point you want to get uh, also the, I mean, what people that are not friendly with Black Lives Matter think about. Uh, and a good idea to do that, you know that people that are using Twitter as kind of a political flagpole tend to get organized around hashtags uh, and Obviously, this is case of Black Lives Matter, but if you are willing to look at this monstrum of data set, which is Black Lives Matters, uh, you will find out that there is a bunch of people that are actively hostile to Black Lives Matter, and they have managed to use their own hashtag to gather around, which is Blue Lives Matter, meaning that, I mean, there's no controversy about uh, the police shoots the, to preserve their lives and whatever. Um, so, uh, say that you want to, I mean, get both sides of the political controversy, the, good, the best idea is to look at the other hashtag and see with, again, qualitative eyes, uh, what may be something that is worth to, uh, I mean, get delve into uh, because it may contain something interesting. Or you could, um, maybe if by chance, you could start, uh, investigating something with a minor hashtag, okay? Um, I don't know, you start with, 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 with a uh, Black Lives Matter example, you start from I Can't Breathe, which is strongly correlated with George Floyd, and for some reason you are totally convinced that I Can Breathe is a totally isolated social movement. Um, and then at some point you see that it co course a lot with Black Lives Matter and says, well, what is this Black Lives Matter thing? Um, and then you are aware because like 90% of the posts with the 
me, um, no, me, not me too, sorry, uh, I can breathe are also including Black Lives Matter. Uh, so you're, if you are in, willing to um, investigate the whole mobilization of Afro African Americans, the good idea would be to get both I can breathe and Black Lives Matter, and that would be like a monster. I mean, computer to do that or very, or a lot of time. Uh, the last thing you can do is to extract um, an, an air tweet network. Sorry, this is just an air tweet network because uh, that's the thing that I usually use. I think that I'm most productive, but that's just me. Um, and these last lines, uh, what they do is uh, actually produce that. Uh, you know if you use Gephi, and you will know uh, when you um, actually engage with Ale, Ale Gandini uh, for the YouTube class, um, that, that um, I mean, Gephi requires um, a little bit of a file that is formatted either in a Gephi format or a CSV that is formatted like this. And I'm going to show you how. Uh, nope. Okay. Oh, remember to hit the cells in a row because uh, you may need some instruction that is previous cells. Okay, so let me uh, refresh things, uh, which is uh, array network CSV. So you will need to feed into Gephi, you will need something done like that. Okay, I will leave it to Ale to explain to you how it's done, but basically uh, you would need these to feed into Gephi to generate the visualization and to generate all the network metrics. Okay, it's 1 p.m. and uh, I would gladly skip the whole, um, I mean, hand exercise into data cleaning because I think I can do it on your own. Uh, and I think it's best to dedicate some time to uh, answering questions and then can go eat because I mean, it's 1 p.m. Guido, actually, I do have a question. Yes. Actually, I have yes. a couple of yes, questions. Please. And my 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 face is on the screen. I share so oh. it's big. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, no, nothing. Uh, I I have a question. It's my mainly theoretical one. First uh, is uh, when me... do you read? Okay. Yes. Oh, screen sharing. Uh, okay. So my, my question is related to the saturation or what is called saturation in uh, mm. research. So basically when a, we can consider it a data set completed, when your data, I mean, when you start, you can start with the, the analysis because your data is basically saying nothing more and is not adding anything more about your research. And the second, because yesterday uh, within our group, we had this discussion on mm -hmm. if we have to sample, okay, let's say, uh, Mm. that set and you decided to create uh, um, a sort of keywords list okay mm. to see mm. uh, what mm. posts or what tweets are more relevant to you then you have mm. to justify the choice yes. of those yes. keywords yes. Yes. and yes. even if you search for hashtags or whatever how do you proceed in this sense so you consult first theory do you have do you rely on previous research do you agree with the um, research group so how the reflexivity behind this process in terms of creating a data set and one, when you, you can consider complete your data set and saturation, mm. basically. Okay, the, the dreaded question is, uh, the, the, the dreaded answer to the dreaded question is it depends. Uh, meaning what? Um, as I told in the beginning, we are usually working with complete data sets. Okay, meaning that uh, ideally, okay, so that's, that's, that's ideal but probably going to sample and whatever. Uh, but if you're going to study uh, Me Too, for example, we're going to study the whole of it. So every single post that I've been, including Me Too. At some point, this is a convenient sample because obviously you could, you could, you could, um, um, you could include every, so say probably you're not super interested into um, studying exactly every post that has me too in their content, but you're probably studying something more abstract like uh, how uh, males deal with uh, feminism. So 
how males deal with a uh, feminist, uh, an online feminist movement. So um, probably that would mean taking other uh, tweets with other with other hashtags or even without any hashtags. And I guess that's trade off that 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 you need to make at some point, and that depends on your research on. I mean, research practice on your epistemology, on the kind of 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 kind of research design that you're willing to do. My take on that would be like that: is that first of all, you find out some keyword, okay, and you basically download everything that's exactly on that keyword. Then you make a second pass and you see what's uh, basically you can um, download tweets for every every i mean word but you usually use a hashtag for epistemological reasons because you want to investigate um usually you want to investigate conscious behavior of people because you are a sociologist not a psychologist and you want to investigate conscious behavior of people about something um and people uh which we suppose are proficient in using twitter usually use hashtags to I mean, they could a certain message either uh, because they're pro it or because against it. But the best idea would be to gather some hashtag which are, um, I mean, use it as mobilization tools. But that's my thing because I usually research for social movements and those kind of content. So that's a strategy that works in that in that direction. Uh, if you were willing to, for example, discuss about uh, a commercial brand which may be the case for the summer school, uh, maybe using using an hashtag would be not a good idea. Maybe you would use uh, the brand name or something. But the first step in my case would be to gather everything. So uh, your objection to that might be, well, when do I stop into adding sub layers to that, into adding other content that is marginally related to that? I don't have a clear answer for that, but I have, I mean, comforting news. Um, you're probably all aware that digital networks are, I mean, um, let's say very concentrated, meaning that you have a handful of nodes that produce content that are widely reshared. So your interactions with Twitter are not producing content as much as uh, sharing content produced by others. Meaning that if you are familiar with a, dat a rather large data set or something that has, I mean, uh, been going um, to a lot of mobilizations that have a lot of people interesting to that find, we'll find out that people are actually uh, just relays of something. Okay, so um, there is this example that I'm studying right now, which is Insulin for All, which is the social movement that uh, it's in the US and it's protesting against the high cost of insulin that uh, which has dire consequences for uh, American people okay um, and then at some point you find out that some days uh, it's rather low key so people are actually doing a couple of hundred tweets a day but at some point something happens and someone very famous uh, stumbles upon a tweet by one activist of that and then it reshares to his own Twitter feed. And then what happens is the other blue check, check mark types reshare that thing and the thing snowballs after you have 300,000 tweets in one day because that's how Twitter works. So if you ask me, uh, when should I stop? Uh, my um, advice would be take the big one. So uh, if you are willing to, unless you have a very specific research question that deals with uh, people that are not on the uh, so people that are on the tail of social networks so you are specifically interested into people that are not famous not willing to be or not willing to communicate or snob get into that kind of snowball but that is basically the 10% I mean, of Twitter okay but if you're willing to have a, a complete network of that uh, the idea is that at some point you need to draw the, the limit yourself and that you should do with your research group and according to literature, uh, the larger, the better, but that also depends on kind of analysis technique that you're using. But still, if you need to sample 
uh, you don't need to random sample. That's 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 my take. You need to just take the top layer. If you want, if your idea is that you are willing to isolate content that is popular, to that regard, Twitter is wonderful because you you can know what's inside a data set just by looking at the 10 most popular tweets. Okay. And it, uh, if you do qualitative research on that, you will know that this is true and you will experience that it is true. So if you open up, I mean, million strong data set, you can instinctively know what's in the data, what's in one given day, just by looking at the top 10 tweets. Okay, so my advice, if you are to do something which is heavily qualitative and interpretative, um, sample, but sample the top players, okay? Something else? Okay, Guido, maybe it's time for lunch break. Yeah, time for lunch, I think. I think. Uh, just a piece of information. Uh, it was your birthday yesterday, right? Yes, it oh, was. Oh, happy birthday, Guido. Thank you. Virtual applause. Um, so uh, this afternoon will be a group work. So it's up to you to organize all the stuff uh, with your supervisors, of course. And we will reconvene tomorrow at 9 for the lesson on Con, um, network analysis and content analysis. Okay, so we saw today the first part, how to collect data. Tomorrow we'll see what we can do with this data. So uh, thank you so, so much. Thank you, thank you, Guido. And let's see you later or, or tomorrow. Yeah, for the groups that are working with, uh, I mean, for obviously the, the 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 Alexa group dropped me an email um, to get in touch and to. Uh, do stuff together, but also for the AstraZeneca group, if you want to know something, we, we do have a Telegram chat going on. Um, so drop me a, I mean, contact me. Okay. Cool. Bye bye, guys. Bye. See you later. Bye. Thank you.